Let me throw my at you. That's a lawsuit waiting. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Ryan Kitty. Uh, I am a business and e-commerce attorney. I represent clients of all sizes, from freelancers and solopreneurs to enterprises. Um, I've been practicing for um, eight years, um, in solely in the state of Florida, and I'm here today to talk to you about taking the FUD out of your online business. For those of you that don't know, that's the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And we're going to be focusing primarily on limiting your legal liability. It should come as no surprise that this attorney comes with a disclaimer <laughs> that while I am an attorney, I'm not necessarily your attorney, though I do represent some of you. Um, so the presentation today is for informational purposes only uh, and is not a substitute for actually speaking with an attorney that has the opportunity to re um, review your specific uh, facts and circumstances. So when we look at limiting legal liability, we're looking to do that for three major reasons. Um, the first of which is compliance. Obviously, complying with the law can save you a lot of money up front, rather than having to have your website shut down, having to deal with fines, having to pay for costly litigation. You do not want to have to go to court for any reason. So we're here today to educate you about what laws you should be considering and complying with so you don't have to go down that road. Also, credibility. Um, having uh, things like privacy policy in terms of use on your website, first of all, establish credibility with your end user and your clients. Um, they know that you're a sophisticated entrepreneur. But also things that, um, like contracts. You're not going to send a legal Zoom contract to an enterprise level client. They're going to know right off the bat that you're ill-equipped to handle the level of project. Um, that they're looking to handle. These, when I say enterprise, if you're um, not familiar, those are the larger companies when you think Netflix. Um, you don't want to send them a legal Zoom contract. And similarly, you don't want to send a mom and pop company, you know, a, a small side project, a 25 page, you know, monstrosity of a master service agreement, because they're going to be terrified and you're going to lose business. So having proper contracts in place is also a way of establishing credibility with people you work with. And lastly, deterrence. Obviously, um, if you have your uh, legal contracts in place, your privacy policy, your terms of use, you're going to be reducing your exposure to lim um, legal liability um, because you have clear agreements, um, clear understandings, and they're far less likely to be disputes, and you've created leverage for yourself because you have everything in writing to actually negotiate a settlement without actually having to go to court, which again, if we learn nothing else, we do not want to go to court. It's extremely expensive. So, what we're going to cover today for ways to limit your legal liability, um, forming the company, the privacy policy, the terms of use, trademark, and copyright. I'm going to uh, ask if there's questions in between the segments, so feel free to let me know if there's something that you'd like to discuss in more detail. I want to make sure that the people in this room are getting their questions answered. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on corporate formation because I have a feeling a lot of you have probably already gone through the process uh, in the state of Florida. But part of what I want to do is help you guys save money. Um, there's certain things that you need to speak to an attorney for, and there's certain things that you can do yourself and, and save yourself money. Um, with sunbiz.org, uh, the website at the top, is where you go with the division of corporations in the state of Florida to form your business entity. The three most popular um, forms of business are the limited liability company, uh, corporation, an S-Corp, and a C-Corp. The limited liability company is the preferred method for small businesses because it's the least formal process. Uh, you're not dealing with uh, shareholders, boards of directors, which you think of when you think of a more uh, formal uh, corporation. Um, the difference between the S-Corp and the C-Corp, the C-Corp is what you typically think of when you think of a Fortune 500 company with the board of directors, the multiple shares and classes. And the drawback to that, in, in, in addition to being more formal and having more stringent reporting requirements, is the fact that um, you're taxed twice. You're taxed at a corporate level and uh, at a personal or individual level. So on your income and also on your corporate income. Um, so unless you're dealing with multiple uh, shareholders and, and classes of stock and things, that's probably not going to be the way you want to go. Um, so you would choose, if you were going to go the S-Corp route, you would choose the corporation through sunbiz.org. 
and then you would make the tax election through the IRS um, for for the S corp, which you can choose how you want to be treated um, for tax purposes. And this is something that you're going to want to talk to your accountant with as well, because there's other considerations for how and why you want to structure your business. If you have um, individual debt such as uh, child support or alimony, um, you're differentiating your individual debt from your business debt. So you're going to want to, number one, talk about what's best for your business, and number two, talk about what is best for you uh, personally. Again, when we're talking about le uh, legal liability, I just want to make sure um, that you understand you're differentiating between personal and business for something that, like if you're in a car accident. If you, God forbid, accidentally rear end someone, having a corporate structure and following you know, the rules and responsibilities that you need to do to maintain that corporate structure means that the person will only be able to come after you as an individual and not go after your business assets. So it's a small investment. Again, you can uh, do this online in less than five minutes. Um, what you would actually want to pay for the consultation is making sure that you're selecting the right uh, entity, but it's something that you guys can do quick and easy for yourself. Registered agents. Um, so in the state of Florida, we have a lot of transparency, which is both good and bad. Um, if you want to look up somebody online and find out you know, who, uh, who's registered them or whatever, you can find out all of their addresses, which comes into, um, if you're a freelancer, I myself, I work from home, um, I don't necessarily want my home address uh, advertised, for, especially with an attorney. I, some people don't like attorneys, it's weird. <laughs> I don't want them to be able to find me at home. Um, so, you know, get a corporate mailbox so you're not receiving mail and it's not a matter of public um, uh, knowledge where you live, but also a registered agent. So this can be anybody, it can be your lawyer, it can be your uh, accountant, and some even uh, mailbox services will offer a registered agent service. This is basically the person that you designate or appoint to receive mail or legal service on your behalf um, during business hours. So if you are a freelancer or you work from home, someone has to be able to receive, you know, if, if you were summons or a subpoena or something like that. Um, these are typically services that they may charge for, um, some attorneys included if they handle your incorporation. Just, you know, ask and see um, what's included, but again, that's a way to not have your personal home information online through subbase.org. Um, uh, EIN number, just a pro tip, again, saving you guys money, you're welcome. Um, so through the IRS, you can get your uh, EIN number. That's the electronic identification number that you're going to need in order to um, open a bank account under your, your business name. So a lot of people will charge money for this service, but yes, go ahead. Um, is it easy to switch from one to the other through an LLC to switch to an S Corp or through an S Corp to switch to an LLC? Um, you're, I believe you're allowed to do it one time to change between the two of them, but it's a relatively easy process. Again, um, it's a form through sunbiz.org, and it can all be done online. And it's a pretty self-explanatory. Um, like I said, I mean, what you're really when you what you're going to want to hire an attorney for is if you have a, um, a partner and you need a shareholder agreement, you need an operating agreement. When you're getting more specific with how your business is structured and you're bringing more people into it, um, you're absolutely going to want to document what documents in place, but for the actual filing itself, you'll see its name, address, registered agent, uh, you know, officers and things like that. So once you know what kind of um, organization you want to form, it's relatively easy. Yeah? It says limited liability, but is it really, are you somewhat protected or like how does that, you know? Like yeah. How protected are you? I guess. Um, so I mean, so the the reason that it's limited liability is it's the um, they're they're looking at the amount of um, investment. So your your share of the uh, debt and liability is commensurate with your um, what you're putting into the company. Um, but yes, what the you have to maintain certain standards. So <laughs> there's a there's a lot that goes into it, but. Um, they have piercing the corporate veil is what the, the legal standard for. If you, if I have a company and you want to sue me, I, I ran into you and you want to sue my company, they look for have I maintained my annual records, have I filed my minutes, am I actually treating this business as a business or am I running it personally, running my finances through it. As long as I'm 
maintaining the accounting and the, and the actual business structure, then yes, it absolutely limits your liability. Um, it does exactly what it says it will do. So, privacy policies. Um, <coughs> privacy policies are an interesting thing to talk about because nobody knows that they're legally required to have them. Um, so, a, a best practice in the U uh, U.S. A privacy law is not federal, meaning all states have different rules and regulations uh, for, for what is applicable. And the best practice is, obviously, to adhere to the most stringent law in the land. If you adhere to the most stringent, then you never have to worry because you're conforming. That law in, uh, in the U.S. is almost always California. When we look at intellectual property rights, anything uh, to do with computer technology, obviously we have Silicon Valley, so we're conforming with uh, California. And California has CALAPA. And CALAPA states, if you collect any personally identifiable information that you're legally required to have a privacy policy. Well, what's personally identifiable information? It's somebody's first name, or last name, or telephone number, or email address. It's not all of those things. It's any one of those things. So even if you're just running a blog, um, and you ask for a, an email address for a newsletter, you're legally required to have a privacy policy. Um, if you have a contact form, I, I mean, I've talked to attorneys, I've talked to enterprise level businesses, they're like, well, I'm not collecting personally identifiable information, I just have a contact form. Yes, you do, and you're collecting personally identifiable information. Um, the great news is, having a privacy policy is not an expensive process. This is not something that's going to cost you thousands of dollars. Um, you're being proactive, again, establishing that credibility with your clients to tell them how, what data you're collecting, how you're treating it, whether you're using cookies, behavioral analytics. Um, in 2014, uh, CalAPA also added that you have to um, provide notice of whether you honor do not track. So in web browsers like uh, Google, um, you can go in there and turn off the, the cookies mechanism so you're legally required to state whether you honor the do not track signals or not. And you're, when they ask that question, they're also asking if your plugins or your third party processes are as well. So for best practice pro tip, just say you don't uh, honor them. You're not required to honor them. If you're not sure and somebody else could, don't be wrong. <laughs> um, err on the side of caution on that. Can I add to that real quick? Yes, absolutely. So you can't pay me gateways, which we're going to talk about later today. You can't set up an account with like authorized.net if your website doesn't have a published privacy policy at the bottom of the website. Yeah, so Amazon um, and Amazon and eBay, um, a lot of the third party uh, marketplaces and things require it. Again, they're reducing their, their liability um, by requiring you to have one. Um, you'll see that the uh, mobile apps are a part of this as well. Um, something that I run into and a favorite question is, you know, yeah, I know you're telling me that I have to uh, adhere to the law, but they're not really enforcing that. Why do I need to, why do I need to do that? Um, yeah, so they enforce that arbitrarily. Uh, the state of California kind of uses it as a fundraiser. Um, the last time that they had a major, the, the last time that they uh, had a major bout was uh, 2012, and they sent out um, a couple of thousands of notices to mobile app developers uh, to let them know that they were fining them. Um, they had 30 days to cure, and if they didn't, it would be uh, $2,500 um, for every download of the app. So you have to have a privacy policy if you have an app and you're collecting personally identifiable information. Yes, sir. Quick question on that. What's sufficient notice on the website? You said something in the footer? Is it a separate page? Or on so the, the itself? yeah, that, great question. The CALAPA requirement is that it's on the home page. Uh, it con contains the word privacy. Um, so typically if you have it in, a, in your footer, um, oh, in it, its first page, uh, contains the word privacy or a hyperlink link on the first available page that is practicable. Put it on the home page. Like it's in the footer. It's common practice. Everyone does it. You're not going to look odd or or scare people away by having it there. So there's no reason not to. Yeah. Follow up. Is there some verbiage that's copy paste verbiage to write, or is it just be simple? 
simple as you collect name, email, phone, be aware that it's safe in our database? So a lot of the verbi verbiage is similar and you're going to see the same thing over and over again. There's a set list of things that you have to include. So you have to say what data you're collecting, how you're using it, if you're storing it, how long you're storing it, are you using um, a third-party payment processor, um, things like that. But there are also specifics involved with your, your, how your site is specifically treating the information. So some things are, are kind of boilerplate and, and the same thing over and over again, but when you're dealing with, like if you were gonna sell this service to, to your end user, or tell them you know, this is something that you need to consider, you have to go through their, their process, and it's gonna give, get even more, wait, wait till we get to GDPR, because it's gonna get even more fun uh, with that. Um, I just wanted to touch really quickly on uh, the, the COPPA. If you um, work with uh, websites, or uh, any of your clients work with websites that are specifically geared to children 13 or under, you need to include that in your privacy policy, and you need to, um, you said, are some things the same and some things different? If you are advertising specifically to children under, under 13, this is a major variant, because you have to have parental controls and guidelines and things like that that you need to comply with. This, I just want you guys to be aware of. Moving on. Is it trying to reach children under 13 to them to look at a website, or you're trying to reach the parents to sign them up for activities even if they are seven years old? So I represent a client that is a children's author, um, and he has you know fuzzy gnomes and has created a fictitious world. We'll think Dr. Seuss. Um, you know, he said, well, I'm not, really, I'm not really advertising to the children, I'm advertising to the parents to get them to buy the books for their children. I'm like, yeah, but when we, if somebody takes you to court and you have this fuzzy gnome and you're selling, you know, teddy bears or care bears, you know, do you think that a court is going to say that you're advertising specifically targeting children or not? And the answer is, yeah. I mean, you're selling a kid's product to kids um, and things like that. So he has to have fail-safes in his privacy policy and how he does business where Parental consent is. Do you have your parents' permission to do this? You know, um, you know the law, the, the Children's Online Privacy Act is pretty specific about what you have to do to adhere. Really, anything on the internet. You can't stop a 13-year-old in California from finding your website and signing up for a sewing kit. And you're you're going towards 55. Years right, but there's a but there's but, but the requirement for COPPA is different in that you're specifically marketing to it. So if you're Disney World. Right. And you're and you're and you have children's content. The right. court is going to find that that's a marketing. You're gearing your your stuff towards children. Where a sewing kit, yes, a kid could acquire it, but what kind of legal liability or responsibility do you have? So it's the, again, it's so are you specifically you have it in your marketing? Privacy policy is what your policy right. is. You're right. Right. And, and you say in your privacy policy, if you're a sewing kit, you say, I'm not specifically marketing to children under 13. Everyone can say that, but again, with my somebody that came to me, um, that's probably not going to hold up if you're selling dolls and, and you know, things to your books are geared to children under 6. It's kind of you know, common sense on that. So I want to talk to you about um, GDPR. I'm not going to do a comprehensive, uh, in-depth analysis of this. Um, I want you guys to be aware of it. Um, it's the new EU and Great Britain um, regulation that's coming into effect. And you might be asking me, Ryan, I'm not doing international law. I'm not selling to people in Europe. Why would I care? Because this law applies to you whether or not you're um, actually conducting business or not. It's whether an EU citizen visits your website and you collect um, sensitive, or excuse me, data from them. And they take their um, data definition a step further than we have here in the US they actually have gone through the trouble of differentiating between personal data and sensitive data so again we talked about email addresses first names last names things like that they're now um, actually considering photos uh, if you take anybody's uh, photo um, and they're differentiating between the sensitive data um, for biometric data uh, the financial institutions that take your fingerprints um, height, weight, sexual orientation, religious affiliation, um, things like that. And why they've taken, oh, I wanted to note, um, sorry, the online identifier with the IP addresses, again, is what you're going to want to be concerned with. Um, because it's not just that you're, you now have the newsletter that is actively asking for their email address. Um, if you have plugins on your site, 
that are collecting um, the analytics uh, or their IP addresses or the cookies. You're responsible for um, the plugins and also your processors. They've, they've included kind of joint liability. Um, so you want to make sure that you're using credible companies to uh, handle and process your um, credit card information. Um, and please, this is not all gloom and doom, and this is not to all terror. Um, WordPress is working on uh, the GDPR project. They are extremely aware of it. They've published a lot of documentation. They're working to get these um, plugins certified and, and deal with the compliance aspects. Um, but again, I want you to be uh, knowledgeable about it because you're going to be working with your clients to map out their processes. If you're designing websites, if you're doing the development, this is something that you have to consider now in design um, because you need to be limiting the amount of data that you're collecting only to what your client actually needs. Where before in the U.S. it's kind of in the wild, wild west of collect as much as you can. You're now responsible for what you collect, how you store it, who has access to it. Um, so. They differentiated between sensitive data and personal data so they could add additional consent requirements. So with the uh, increased uh, consent requirements, um, sensitive data, you now have to have explicit permission. Where um, with personal data, uh, Asking somebody for an email address and them entering it in is sufficient. Clearly, I'm I'm consenting to give you my information. It's pretty cut and dry. You ask me for my email address, I give it to you. With um, with the sensitive data, I have to have clear knowledge of why you're collecting it, uh, what you intend to do with it, and the explicit consent uh, comes in where you're no longer allowed to have the pre-checked boxes. Um, for privacy policies or, or things like that, it has to be opt-in. So that's a design change that you guys are going to want to be aware of. And again, best practices. The, it's the law now in the EU. We have to adhere to it if we're collecting any of this data um, from citizens of the EU. Um, but we're going this way in the U.S. as well. Um, we have Zuckerberg testifying before Congress about da data and privacy issues. Silicon Valley is already saying, hey, the GDPR has uh, revamped. We should go in this direction, too. So just be aware of this and start to um, style. The other thing is with this 72-hour uh, notice um, of a breach requirement, that's going to require you know, testing. And again, uh, the, the platforms and the plugins actually building this in um, is a major part of it. But it's something from a maintenance standpoint that you're going to want to talk to your clients about because you're going to, going to want to test, are they able to be aware of a breach and notify their users within 72 two hours? This might be a continued uh, managed service that you might offer as part of your maintenance plan if you're a developer and, and do that. We kind of already covered the affirmative consent versus explicit consent, um, which differentiates between um, the uh, personal data and sensitive data. Do anybody have questions about GDPR with what I covered? Nathan? I have two questions for you. First, yes, sir. 72 hours from when you become aware of the breach or when it actually happens? Um, when you come become aware of the breach and it's as, as practical, uh, practical, sorry. <laughs> um, it's that sliding scale. We lawyers really like uh, job security. So we try not to make uh, hardline rules as much as possible so we can argue over things and you can pay us money to do it. Um, so <laughs> it's as soon as, you know, as soon as you become aware and they're going to, the, um, the GDPR and the EU, they're going to determine whether you knew or should have known, whether you should have done it in 72 hours. And the longer you delay, like we just had, uh, what, um, Under Armour? Just had the My Fitness Pal breach in what January or February. I didn't get a notice. It didn't. Two, three months went by, and it was leaked on the news. So they're going to be uh, prosecuting this. And again, a lot of people in the U.S. are like, "Well, you know, I don't know how they're going to do it." They're the same people that enforce the VAT tax. Um, you know, this is a yeah, 26, 28 countries coming together to on, on one cohesive body of law, and they're going to enforce it. So obviously, I feel a bit secure with my small business when there's a, a lot larger companies to go after first. But you know, as of May 25th, we're going to start seeing how this uh, affects all of us. Yeah. So yeah, the second question is so. 
you know, I've got a website, people sign up for an email list, they may or may not be from Europe. I mean, if I don't have some sort of GDPR pop-up or banner or whatever, am I going to get like a bill from The Hague or something, uh, you know, for every violation, or how does that work? Yeah, so they, I mean, they, they've created uh, the data protection agencies, and they're going through how that's going to work right now. So you actually have an ability to vote or weigh in, or at least the EU developers and programmers do, as far as what's going to happen, um, because they have audits. They have a, a, a system. Actually, I'll send a send a link, and I'll post a link to my to my site. That GDPR has a really good kind of like infographic of what happens with the um, first. You get a warning. Uh, then you get uh, some kind of like statement of misuse and then you start getting fined and um, they're, they're prosecuting people. One of the things if you're collecting sensitive data, if you're processing information, meaning storing information, um, and a lot of people that have private servers do, you have to appoint a representative in the EU, which, yeah, yeah. So, like I said, with the uh, state of Florida, you have to have a registered agent. They're doing the same thing for that. So you have to appoint somebody in the EU to accept service so they can sue you in the EU. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Yeah. So that's uh, everyone's trying to figure out how this is going to happen. I'm like, oh, I know how it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I partner, I'm a career coach, and I partner with a firm that does something like um, data protection and privacy for people who are you know, inventory of, you know, a lot of this sensitive information. Do I trust them to cover, you know, that the protection of that information if I'm partnering with them and paying them to provide that? Or do I need to make sure I also have, you know, a, you know, protection on my site? So the responsibility is twofold. So the GDPR differentiates between data controllers and data processors. So a data controller is the person who determines what information is collected, i.e. the person who's creating the website. Typically your client, not necessarily as much the developer. Um, they're talking about the person that actually says, okay, I want to collect email addresses or whatever, and the person that's actually processing the information. So a lot of times that's the Stripe, the PayPal, the things like that. Again, these large companies are aware that the GDPR is coming into effect, that one of the exemptions under the 1995 law, because that's the last time it was revamped, um, was iCloud-based companies were exempt. And again, this has changed. It has no, it, no bearing of where you're located. It's if you're doing business, collecting information from EU citizens, regardless of where you are. So you're going to want to have your GDPR compliant uh, privacy policy in place. You're going to list that company saying, you know, I've partnered with Stripe for payment processing, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, when I draft privacy policies, um, you know, I put in there, you know, that those are third party affiliates and you're, they're uh, responsible for their own privacy policy. I'm not, you know, responsible for their privacy policy, but you should be aware and take a look once you leave my site. Their, their information guides, but you absolutely want to make sure when you're vetting people for who you do business with, there might be a really new, great new company coming up that's going to give you a better deal on, on you know, your swiping or whatever, but if they don't have the infrastructure and institution in place to protect and safeguard this information, you could be jointly liable for a breach. Um, or and, and again, they're going to be looking at, should you knew, known or should have known, you know, they're going to be looking, it's not... They're going to be looking at a totality of the circumstances for all of this stuff. So if it was egregious, negligent breach on, I, I know I'm using a lot of legal, legal terms, but I, I don't want you guys to be afraid. I want you to be informed, and I want you to know what questions to ask, and, and to know what laws that you should be looking at, um, because that's going to make, that's going to protect you on your legal liability. Yes, ma'am. I have one more question. I'm so sorry. Um, how, do you, how do you vet an attorney to do this? Yeah. yeah. Because a lot of attorneys say, oh, I can help you with that. Just I use Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> she, I'm in Kentucky. So, yeah. you want to, you know, practice in Kentucky. Well, no, um, so, so, I mean, hopefully I'm going to have time to get to, um, uh, trademark and, and copyright, but um, first of all, you want to be looking for attorneys that have a background in e-commerce. It's not just business attorneys. Business attorneys with e-commerce background. Uh, and intellectual property is a good place to start because intellectual property copyright trademark is ever evolving and it's very closely tied and related to technology. You can't be involved in, I mean, all of my, my clients that I deal with that are coming to me with trademarks and, and 
things like that, or people that have websites. Everyone has to have a website to be in business. So um, that's a really great, great place to start. But that's a great question. Um, I, that you do vet attorneys. You do interview us as much as we interview you to do our website, and it's something that uh, people need to understand. You know, the the internet has disrupted the way everyone uh, delivers services and products. Um, so the antiquated notion that you need to pay a $10,000 retainer in order to be able to ask a legal question is absurd. Um, you need to find attorneys that are willing to quote per project, flat fee pricing where possible. If it's a research project or something that they can't possibly calculate the amount of time, then you know it's going to be hourly. But um, always ask you know what's included with that service. Um, when I do uh, uh, excuse me trademarks. You know, I do that on a flat fee basis. I've seen people that have gone to attorneys that have billed on an hourly basis um, for the filing of the application, and then when the office action comes back from the examining attorney with the USPTO, they charge hourly for that response. The problem with that being every single trademark you ever file has an office action coming back from the examining attorney again it's how we justify the fact that we actually read the contract as we find something that needs to be changed every single time and so is that fair that you're paying for basically standard correspondence yes it takes time but i know how much time it's going to take before i get involved right um so yeah, if you ever have questions about how to vet an attorney or somebody knows what they're talking about, yeah, to feel, free to, feel free to ask me. I just had a client whose mother decided to help out with their trademark and filed a state trademark instead of a federal trademark in the wrong, in the wrong class. Um, so not only did they just throw that money away, but they actually invited a lawsuit because they filed in a class that somebody else had already registered that name. And it's, yeah, I can help you with that, but we're not good at everything. Like I'm, I'm not a patent attorney. I'm not going to try to do that. I'm not a family lawyer. I will never represent anyone in a divorce. Um, you know, find the people that this is what they do because they're going to be up, up to speed on, on what you need. Um, I want to talk quickly about terms of use. This is your con. Yes, ma'am. Like um, you talked about e the UK and the EU, but I didn't. The difference between the two is it just parallel? It's the same. So Bre Brexit, Brexit, uh, the Great Britain uh, actually departed from the EU, but they've signed on at least now for now to adhere to the GDPR. So when they leave, they'll have their own, but it'll be like, it'll be a mirror image. We we don't know what they're going to do yet, but they don't know what they're going to do yet. Right now, they've signed on to the GDPR, so they're one of the companies that, or excuse me, the countries that we that is complying and we need to be aware of. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, okay, so terms of use. Uh, it's your contract in place between you and your end users. Uh, similar to the privacy policy, it's something you typically want to have a, a footnote in, in your uh, website to. The reason you do this is to have a written and enforceable contract. You're going to um, have a notice of the agreement. You're, you, in your contract, you're going to be looking for key provisions and clauses, such as uh, limiting damages. So if your site is unavailable for any reason or if you're developing for somebody um, and their site becomes unavailable, you can limit the damages to um, the amount that they've actually paid you. Um, this is a contractual agreement between the two of you. Um, much like we had talked about previously with opt-in, uh, where possible, especially if somebody's hiring you to do something and they're actually affirmatively paying you, um, having that become an opt-in where they're, again, affirmatively consenting to these terms of use, it's going to increase its enforceability. So I just want you guys to be aware of that. Again, um, looking at third-party, uh, excuse me, yeah, third-party liability, um, your affiliates, your um, disclaiming, I'm not responsible once you leave my site for anything that they do. Um, I'm not guaranteeing the services that they provide. Indemnification. Um, Yeah, if you have, does anyone have questions about indemnification in general? Or are you guys kind of, okay. So indemnification, okay, sorry. <laughs> so indemnification is basically, um, I'm not live, I'm not going to um, reimburse you for um, infringement or the costs, you know, if you, if you provide me with uh, conflicting or infringing um, work and I upload it to my site, then you're going to uh, be responsible and if I I can go after you 
and have you pay for the, the legal fees as well. So, um, then you're going to want an indemnification clause uh, in your terms of use. Uh, jurisdiction, uh, governing law, where they can sue you. This is huge because you're putting your, your website on the World Wide Web. So you want to make sure that you're establishing that they can only sue you in the state in which you're located uh, where possible. Um, and how they can sue you. If you wanted to consider an arbitration or mediation clause, the terms of use is a great place to do that. Um, you also uh, will prevent abuses by going through your specific payment policy, shipping policies if you have them. As clear as you can be about the rules um, that you intend to be bound by, the better off your terms of use are going to be. And again, we're talking about the compliance, the credibility, and the deterrence. Um, so be as specific as possible. Um, and the termination uh, clause. You're going to want to have in your termination clause that you can uh, shut down their account or their access to your site for any reason um, because you don't know if, if they post something that is lewd, lascivious, obscene, offensive, um, you want to reserve that right to yourself. Something else, um, we're, we're kind of transitioning, so I just, does anyone have any questions uh, about terms of use before I move on to copyright, because this is a kind of a transition. Um, so in, a, um, in your terms of use, you're also going to want to have a DMCA uh, disclaimer. That's the Deligi uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act. This is a free pro tip. This is free to do online. Um, I provided you guys with the um, URL, uh, with the online tutorial. But you're um, actually entitled to certain safeguards under the law by designating this um, agent. So if you have a website or a blog or something where you allow people to upload information, if you allow them to upload comments, reviews, uh, photos, or anything that could be potentially infringing, or they could claim that they have a copyright uh, to, and you're infringing by making use of it, you're going to want to um, designate a copyright agent um, because you're going to get safeguards and protections. Um, I've also taken the liberty of giving you, giving you guys a free uh, DMCA sample clause for your terms of use. I don't expect you guys to write it down. I will upload my slides, and you can take pictures if you want. Um, but this is something that is, um, you know, switch out your name for website and corp. Um, but that's the adequate clause that you put in your terms of use in addition to registering with the Library of Congress uh, for the copyright. So, um, differences between copyright and trademark. Yay! Yeah. Who, knows, who knows the difference? Yes. So, trademark is when you're applying for a registered name. And copyright is just saying that you have this material is your unique own. That's you know not officially registered as. Perfect. So um, a trademark is so a like gold star. Yes, you do get a gold star, and mm -hmm. you get a book. Oh yay! <laughs> <laughs> so a trademark is an indicator of source. Um, it tells your clients and your customers where something comes from. It can be a word, like the word Nike or the word McDonald's. It can be an image, like the golden arches or the swoosh. It can be a saying, I'm loving it, just do it. Um, any of those things are uh, trademarkable. I know I'm on the copyright slide, but I'm differentiating, so we'll, we'll go on from there. Um, the copyright is um, your actual work of authorship. It's a unique expression or idea. Ideas themselves are not copyrightable. Like Romeo and Juliet, how many times have we seen this story over and over and over again? The idea itself of two star-crossed lovers is not uh, unique. It's the actual expression. So that specific work, that screenplay, that interpretation of it is the thing that is able to be copyrighted. Um, so when we look at things that can be uh, copywritten, it's sound recordings, the underlying music, um, website layouts, um, specific uh, dance moves, even. You know, I haven't filed for copyright for mine yet. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so, legal benefits of, of registering uh, the copyright. Oh, I wanted to tell you. Uh, so, you guys have copyright when it's fixed in a tangible medium, which is the legal definition. What it means is 
As soon as you guys write something down, sketch it on a piece of paper, type it up on your website, uh, or, or um, write it down, you actually have copyright. You don't have to do anything affirmatively to have copyright. The reason that you register with the Library of Congress for copyright is your ability to enforce uh, it against uh, infringement. Um, so going through the uh, benefits, um, it's the evidence of the proof of ownership. You actually are a matter of public record um, that you own this, this work. Um, the innocent infringer defense, oh, I didn't know it was copywritten. Uh, yeah, it's a matter of record. You could have looked it up. You chose to, to use that work without permission. Um, so that's the enforceability aspect. Statutory damages. Um, when you're suing for uh, copyright infringement, it's a lot, it's very difficult sometimes to prove actual damage. I mean, how much money do I lose when you use my name and likeness? How much business do you actually take away from me? So when you actually have it registered with the Library of Congress, you're entitled to statutory damages, um, which is a lot e easier to prove. Um, and I have yeah, between 750 and 30,000 per infringement, and you're entitled to attorney's fees, which if you're looking for an attorney to take the case, uh, it's a lot easier to find one when you've actually um, copywritten it because they know when they win the case that they're actually going to um, get their attorney's fees back. And that can, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, as small business owners, we don't have, you know, $30,000 to throw it out in a suit. But if you have a prevailing case and the attorney knows that they're going to get attorney's fees on the other side, a lot of times you can negotiate a contingency on, on some of those. Um, so, I want to ask a question about yes, that real quick? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, we see like in Facebook, mm -hmm. right, the people will say, this is the Kate Bassett, I'm going to talk about Kate Bassett, the designer, Kate Bassett support group on Facebook. And there's 15 of them, right? But in the um, description, you say it's not the official um, Kate Bassett website, uh, your Facebook group, it's a free group. How does that apply? when he's a branded name but maybe does not have his name copyrighted what's the open liability to that because so many times those groups are free that they push to a website that's a payable membership yeah that's a, a complex um uh, and actually a I'm complex sorry. no 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 no, 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 no. i just um i can't i can't cover it uh and get to get, get to trademarks but what i will say is um so that's actually a name and likeness issue so they're uh, private, uh, we're entitled to a certain level of privacy um, as, as individuals. Right. When we are famous, uh, when we do things that, and it's actually a sliding scale, when you look at defamation, libel, what we're allowed to say or do to someone is actually dependent on uh, their level of, um, their level of uh, familiarity and, and fame. So uh, famous people have a right, um, they, they get parody, parodied, we're allowed to make use of their likeness and their name in certain regards um, when you're detracting from their their livelihood and their they can get an injunction they can stop that if they want to but they have to there's a certain amount of um, in copyright fair use so there's certain things where you're allowed to use yeah, certain yeah. group right be a fan group of well not not necessarily a fan group because again if they're making if they're making commercial profit. If you're a fan group and, and they're charging money and they're taking away from my fan group, then I can show that I'm, you know, they're commercially profiting from my name and my likeness. But it, it's a lawsuit, which that person is entitled to, to bring. But again, they're going to balance out, you know, well, you're a famous person, you know, like what, what's the harm really is what they're looking at. Um, name like us. Um, Uh, fair use, uh, fair use, copyright, um, education. There's there's certain uh, things that are not infringing. Um, so like you know SNL parody, um, things like that. Uh, there's standards of what's acceptable and what's not. How you can use somebody's intellectual property that's allowable, and that's a case by case basis. I'll you are, you offline. Yeah, yo, if you're gonna want to talk to an attorney about that, that's not like I, w I want you guys to have the tools for you know the questions and, and things that you can I can help you with very easily, and you guys can save lots of money. What was your question? Is there a place where I can check something that I have created against fair use and copyright? Mm -hmm. um, you can go to the Library of Congress and um, search their database for uh, certain copyrightable material. 
Um, well, I know the, the material, like the whole thing is copyrighted, mm -hmm. but I used maybe a part of a sentence. Okay, so I'm, I'm an English teacher. I yeah. made it. I made a I'm an English major, and oh, right. because of my English teacher, so thank you for your service. Oh. <laughs> I know it's like you don't you don't hear that with teachers. Thank you for your service, but it is a service, and thank, thank you. you. You're welcome. Um, it wasn't your teacher, but I bet you were fun. <laughs> but, um, so I made a figurative language worksheet lesson plan thing, and I used Kendrick Lamar song lyrics. Mm -hmm. So it's they have there, there's the song lyric. They have to identify what it means, and they have to identify what the like on the surface meaning and then the intended deeper meaning. Right. So I didn't quote like a whole song anywhere, and it's from a series of his songs. So it's like a sentence fragment or a sentence from this song and two lines from another song. Same time two, two, yeah, two separate issues. First okay. of all, what do you intend to do with this? So you using um, it as I use an educator? It, well, I use it in my classroom, but I also want to sell it. Okay. As using it in your classroom as part of the uh, education institutional typically falls under fair use. I can't tell you again. You're going to consult with somebody, but but your use within the classroom shouldn't be a problem. You selling it might be a problem. Okay. And here's a fun thing. So uh, first of all, if, if you were uh, mixing this or remixing it into a song, what you're doing is called sampling. You're mm -hmm. taking a piece of somebody else's work that is absolutely infringing um, and problematic. And again, when I said earlier, we attorneys like to not make clear rules and uh, so we can argue about stuff, there's no clear rule on how much constitutes sampling. So um, when you think about it, it's like, well, I just took two notes. Cool. Were those notes? Da -da. <laughs> da -da. It only takes two notes, right? Um, so you, you know, it's a sliding scale of what's you know what's infringing and what's not. Um, you know, be careful about selling it. Okay. Um, and yeah, talk to an attorney about that one and, and have them look at it closer. It might it might not be a problem. I'm not sure. Um, Want to make sure you guys have the uh, copyright notice. Have it at the bottom of, of all of your footers. Again, I told you guys everything's copywritten as soon as you. Um, you actually fix it in a tangible medium, but this puts people on actual notice that you are claiming copyright. Um, so in the event that there was an entrenchment suit, you can point to this. Um, difference between TM and R, pro tip, uh, you guys can use TM if you're um, claiming trademark rights in uh, your name, your logo, whatever, prior to actually filing for uh, registration at a federal level. The R is for actual um, after it's been approved, your applica application has gone through and you have a registration number. Um, so I wanted you guys to know um, what the difference between that is and also what it means when you're looking at other people's sites. Um, additional benefits for um, federally protecting your, your trademark. Number one, you get federal protection uh, when you're using it in interstate commerce, which means you're precluding other people from using your mark in the other 50 states. So um, you're allowed to use it, other people are not. Um, you want to consider doing this um, fairly early on before you spend tens of thousands of dollars and years of your life pouring your blood, sweat, and equity into your company to find out that somebody else has that name and you're infringing and they not only can they come after um, you know, the, the harm and damage that you've done, but uh, make you change your name and marketing and everything. Um, so I recently, again, the, the client that had the mom that helped them with the trademark, they've been uh, doing business uh, for seven years um, and never filed the trademark and found out that two years ago somebody filed in the international class that they've been operating in. And they've, I mean, they have a restaurant, they've invested um, all of this, and it was... Um, easily preventable. So I want to tell you guys the filing fee um, for uh, trademarks is uh, $275. That's the federal filing fee that does not include legal fees for what an attorney will charge you to do the preliminary search to see if there's any um, competition. Um, thanks. Um, sorry, running through. Anyway, um, trademark your stuff. Ask me more questions. I'll get you the slides. I ran out of time. I apologize very much. I will be in the happiness bar if you guys have um, additional follow-up questions, if there's anything I can help you with. Um, yes. Oh, and, and I'll leave you on this slide. <laughs> Are you going to build us if we ask a question? Yeah. <laughs> I won't. I'm feeling generous today. No. Listen, no. The word, the word camp community is amazing, collaborative. If this is your first word camp, get involved. It, it gets addictive. Everybody's here to help. So. Is it re required to have the copy 
copyright line at the bottom? It's not required, it's not and it's additional protection for yourself. Yeah. Oh, okay. Not, not complying with the law is, I mean, required, and you can do whatever you want, but there's going to be, you know, different uh, consequences for doing or not doing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,